Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, heartening, but entirely expected, to see such a full hall here this evening. And we have uh, a huge number of people uh, online as well. Uh, this is the fourth in the series of, uh, of talks to be given uh, and arranged by the Selden Society at the four Inns of Court in London. The aim of these talks is to demonstrate the importance and significance of legal history uh, to the study and understanding of the law and where we are now. Uh, the uh, earlier talks have demonstrated that uh, extremely well, and I know that this evening's talk, uh, because I've had the, the privilege of seeing it already, uh, does that uh, absolutely as we all would have hoped. Uh, I know that everybody is here uh, to hear one person and not me. But if you'll just forgive me uh, for one moment to speak about last year's speaker. Uh, last year's speaker was a former president of the Southern Society and a former Lord Chief Justice of England, Lord Judge. Uh, and he was a learned, wise, and extremely kind man. Uh, and uh, he will be greatly missed. His loss so soon after giving the, 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 the Four Inns Lecture last uh, year uh, was a great shock to us all. The uh, subject matter uh, of his talk was one which was very close to his heart. And uh, it bears looking at again. Uh, and I'd invite you to do that because it's on the, it's on the website of the, uh, uh, of the Southern Society. Uh, what he was concerned about was the democratic deficit created uh, by the uh, failure uh, of uh, the legislature, legislature to um, scrutinise secondary legislation. Uh, and that uh, really meant that uh, the executive could really more or less do what it wished in creating vast tracts of law without it being looked at by those who are supposed to be uh, passing laws and scrutinizing our freedoms. He, he traced that back in a most learned lecture uh, to its roots in the 17th century. Uh, but he also spoke with great passion and interest uh, about what's happening now. And that, I, I think, he would welcome uh, the thought that it could stand, at least in part, uh, as a memorial to him. Uh, it's there on the website, as I say, as indeed this evening's talk will be. Now, as to this evening's talk, uh, this evening we have uh, matrimony, patriarchy, and the welfare of children, the 200-year struggle to give parents the equal right to bring up their children. The speaker is, of course, as we all know, the Right Honourable Baroness Hale of Richmond. She was a leading academic, a barrister, a law commissioner, a family division judge, a judge of the Court of Appeal, a Lord of Appeal in Ordinary, a Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, and uh, finally, and perhaps most famously, uh, a spider brooch wearing president uh, of the Supreme Court. Uh, she has published widely, spoken on family law, both nationally and internationally, uh, to the betterment of the family justice system, and simply, simply cannot be overstated the contribution which she has made uh, to uh, how our family justice system works and its approach both uh, to uh, the procedures uh, and to the welfare of children. In, not on the list that I just read out of her achievements it is the fact that she's a former treasurer of this inn. Uh, indeed, uh, this evening, most of you will have passed through a gateway that's been renamed after her. So, to some extent, it's an anomaly, my introducing her. Uh, but uh, it's uh, a pleasure and an honour that I'm not going to forego. And so... Brenda, please.
Thank you very much, Don. Uh, it's really worrying to have a street named after one because I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so, mind you, by the time I've got to the end of this lecture, you might be hoping that I am. But there we go. Okay, I'm going to start with Blackstone. Sir William Blackstone famously told us, by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection and cover she performs everything. And one aspect of this was that only the husband had legal powers over the children born to his wife during the marriage, or within what Blackstone called a competent time thereafter, which could be at least up to 10 months. Um, sometimes a little bit stretched, just to make sure that there weren't too many bastards around, but there we go. Anyway, they were presumed to be his children, unless it was proved beyond reasonable doubt that they were not. And this meant that he could decide how the children were to be brought up, with whom they should live, and he could appoint a guardian to make those decisions after he died. In return, the common law did recognize that he had a duty to protect and maintain his children, but it provided no effectual machinery for enforcing those duties. The Court of Chancery did, on very rare occasions, decline to enforce the father's common law rights. The most notable example was the case of Shelley and Westbrook. The poet Shelley deserted his first wife and their children and went off with Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, the author of Frankenstein. But when his wife committed suicide, he demanded the children back. This was refused on the grounds that he was an immoral atheist and proposed to bring up the children that way. But refusing to enforce the father's rights was very different from giving the mother any rights. As Caroline Norton, granddaughter of the playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan, found out the hard way. Caroline was a great beauty and society hostess, with a vivacious personality and enough talent as a poet, writer and journalist to make a decent living. She was, however, an unlikely feminist, declaring that she, quote, never pretended to the wild and ridiculous doctrine of equality. Yet her own experience of the injustice of the law led her to fight very effectively for justice. In 1827, she rushed into marriage with George Norton, heir to Lord Grantley, and as Margaret Forster puts it, spent the rest of her life regretting it. Well, she wouldn't be alone in that, would she? But there we go. Um, he was an unsuccessful lawyer who not only expected her to support him, but also from time to time subjected her to serious violence. He was also jealous of her social success. And they had three sons together, Fletcher, Brinsley, and William. Things came to a head in 1835, 36, when William was about three, when she planned to take the children to her sister's home for Easter. He forbade it, and while she was out, took the children away and barred her from returning to the house. Not only that, he brought an action against the then Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, for criminal conversation. Most of you will know that criminal conversation was a euphemism for adultery. Uh, with her. This was then a necessary preliminary to persuading Parliament to pass a bill of divorce. The action failed, but it ruined Caroline's reputation and her friendship with Lord Melbourne. Norton kept their three children away from her and sent them to live with his sister in Scotland, where they were neglected both physically and emotionally, but there was nothing that Caroline could do to get them back. So she studied law with Sergeant Talford, a barrister who specialized in infant cases. And in 1837, she wrote a pamphlet with the very boring title, The Separation of Mother and Child by the Law of Custody of Infants Considered. But actually, the contents were far from boring. She exposed the cruelty of the law and demolished the objections to change. One of her arguments, incidentally, was that um, fathers cannot look after infants without help. This is in the days before formula, you will understand. Uh, whereas, of course, mothers can look after infants without help. 
it's one of her arguments. Uh, so she published this, and at the same time, Sergeant Talford introduced his bill to reform the law. This was passed by the Commons in 1838, but thrown out by the Lords. Well, there we go, that's a story. Uh, eventually, it was passed by both houses in 1839, and is now known as the Custody of Infants Act, or Talford's Act. And thus began the long march of statutory intervention to cure the injustice of the common law, a march which only reached its destination in 1973. The 1839 Act empowered the Lord Chancellor, or Master of the Rolls, to give the mother custody of infants up to the age of seven and access to them up to the age of majority, which was then 21, provided that she had not been found to have committed adultery. It said nothing about the principles to be applied, so it's probable that fathers would only be deprived of their rights on similar principles to those already adopted by the Court of Chancery. In other words, if they badly misbehaved. Ironically, Caroline couldn't herself take advantage of the act at the beginning because her children were in Scotland. And Scotland is, of course, another place. Um, but in 1842, her youngest son died after a fall from his horse, not having been properly looked after. And Norton allowed the two older boys to spend some time with their mother after all that time but always on his terms. He also did his best to get his hands on her money, her earnings, uh, to which, of course, he was entitled before the Married Women's Property Act, uh, but she seemed to have found ways of thwarting him. So that's what she achieved, which was a big step forward. The next big step was the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857. This removed divorce from Parliament and other matrimonial suits from the ecclesiastical courts and gave them to the new court for divorce and matrimonial causes. And this could grant decrees of judicial separation to either husband or wife on the grounds of adultery, cruelty, or two years desertion. It could grant a husband a divorce on the ground of his wife's adultery. But a wife could only divorce her husband on the ground of adultery coupled with cruelty, or two years desertion, or sodomy or bestiality. So at long last, however, it provided that a separated wife could retain her own earnings. And when decreeing judicial separation, nullity, or divorce, the court could make such provision as it may deem just and proper with respect to the custody, maintenance, and education of the children of the marriage. Now this was a different court from the Court of Chancery and it was tasked with applying the same principles as had been applied by the ecclesiastical courts. But it does seem likely that matrimonial behavior or misbehavior would loom large in discerning what was just. And of course, as I've just pointed out, while husbands could divorce their wives for simple adultery, wives could not divorce their husbands uh, for simple adultery, that had to be adultery plus. So I'm sure it was progress, but I'm not sure quite how much progress it was. The 1839 Act, Telford's Act, was replaced by the Custody of Infants Act, 1873. This empowered the Court of Chancery to give the mother custody of, or access to, infants up to the age of 16, and to give the father access if the mother had custody. That sort of reciprocity had been neglected in Telford's Act. Uh, it didn't repeat the adultery proviso. It also validated a father's agreement in a deed of separation to give up custody to the mother. But this was not to be enforced if it would not be for the benefit of the child or children. And this is the first time in statutory language that the interests of the children get a mention. However, I think we can still assume that the court would be reluctant to interfere with the rights of the father. This was, after all, the age of the notorious case of Re Arga Ellis. Arga Ellis and Lassels. A Protestant father had married a Roman Catholic wife and agreed that their children would be brought up as Catholics, but he soon changed his mind. Nevertheless, the mother so indoctrinated their three daughters in Catholicism that at the ages of 9, 11, and 12, they refused to go to a Protestant church. Their father promptly made them wards of court and obtained an injunction prohibiting the mother from taking them to confession or to Roman Catholic places of worship without his consent. 
And he then took the children away from their mother and placed them with other people, allowing the mother to visit them only once a month, and he supervised all correspondence between them. But when the second daughter reached the age of 16, she asked to be allowed the free exercise of her religion and to live with her mother. The father agreed to the former, but not to the latter. And then mother and daughter asked that the daughter spend a summer holiday with her mother and for free access and communication, which the father strongly opposed. So this all went back to the Court of Chancery, and the court refused to interfere with the father's right to control the person, education, and conduct of his children until they're 21 years of age. As the Master of the Rolls declared, the law does not interfere because of the great trust and faith it has in the natural affection of the father to perform his duties and therefore gives him correspondent rights. The rights of the father are sacred rights because his duties are sacred duties. Well, if the law had provided a means of enforcing those duties, that would be plausible, but actually it didn't. So the court would only interfere if the father had forfeited his rights by gross immorality or perhaps cruelty or abandoning the child. Lord Justice Cotton explained the principle that when by birth a child is subject to a father, it is for the general interest of families and for the general interest of children and really for the interest of the particular infant that the court should not, except in very extreme cases, interfere with the discretion of the father, but leave to him the responsibility of exercising that power which nature has given him by the birth of the child. And Lord Justice Bowen explained that the benefit of the infant is not the benefit of the infant as conceived by the court, but it must be the benefit to infants having regard to the natural law which points out that the father knows far better as a rule what is good for his children than a court of justice can. These notions that one person must be in charge and the courts really can't decide what's best for children were to loom very large in dis the discussion which led to the Guardianship of Infants Act 1925. Before that, however, the Guardianship of Infants Act 1886 gave the court power on the application of the mother to make such order as it may think fit regarding the custody of a child up to the age of majority and the right of either parent to have access. Quote, having regard to the welfare of the infant, to the conduct of the parents, and to the wishes as well of the mother as of the father, end quote. So this was clearly a move away from the predominant rights of the father. And the mother was also to become guardian after the death of the father, either alone or jointly with any guardian appointed by the father. And she could appoint a guardian after they both died or nominate a person to serve jointly with the father after she had died, which the court could confirm, but only if the father was unfit to serve alone. But perhaps most important of all in the 1886 Act, the court was no longer limited to the high court and it included the local county courts, making the jurisdiction much more accessible, at least to the middle classes. So that's where we were at the end of the 19th century. But the movement for women's equality saw notable successes as the First World War drew to a close. As we all know, some women became eligible to vote, all women became eligible to stand for Parliament, and all women became eligible to train for the professions, including the legal profession, and to take public office, including the magistracy and judiciary. And in 1919, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies changed its name to the National Union of Societies for Equal Citizenship, NUSEC. NUSEC was committed to achieving real equality of liberties, status, and opportunities between men and women. Equal rights of guardianship were at the forefront of their program. Equal guardianship for married women was also one of the points of the Six Point Group, founded in 1921 by Lady Rhonda, herself a notable feminist campaigner. It was she, a peeress in her own right, who applied for a writ of summons to the House of Lords, which was denied by the Committee of Privileges led by that man there. Despite the Sex Disqualification Removal Act of 1919, in his opinion, 
a peeress in her own right, could not receive a writ of summons, not because she was disqualified from receiving one, but because she had no right to one in the first place. A minor could grow up, a felon could be pardoned, and a bankrupt could achieve his discharge. Quote, but a person who is a female must remain a female till she dies. Well, those are the olden days. <laughs> Apart from a change in the law, she could not before 1919 both be a woman and participate in the legislative proceedings of the House of Lords. By her sex, she is not, except in a wholly loose and colloquial sense, disqualified from the exercise of this right. So the 1919 Act had no effect on it. Now, I don't know. There are a lot of clever lawyers in this room, but I actually find the distinction between a disqualification and an incapacity pretty difficult to understand. There we go. That's a digression, but I just thought I'd better mention it because of him there. Yeah. Anyway, most politicians, no doubt conscious that some women now had the vote, appeared sympathetic to the cause of equal guardianship. In the election held soon after the armistice in 1918, the leaders of the coalition government, uh, David Lloyd-Jones, a liberal, and Andrew Bonalaw, a conservative, gave an election pledge to remove all existing inequalities in law between men and women. The coalition was returned with a massive majority, so it looked as if the time for mother's equality had come. And a bill giving married mothers equal rights with fathers was introduced in 1921 by Sir James Gregg, a liberal, and given a second reading. And bills were introduced in both houses in 1922, and a joint committee of both houses was set up to examine them. Then the coalition government fell in October 1922, and Bonalaw took over as Conservative Prime Minister. Lord Cave, who was to play an important part in the eventual legislation, took over from Lord Birkenhead as Lord Chancellor. Bills were again introduced in 1923. Another joint committee of both houses, chaired by Lord Asquith, not spelt the way that we all spell Asquith, but spelt A-S-K-W-I-T-H, uh, who was a lawyer, and he was again set up to examine them. His draft report was never finalised. The election in December 1923 produced a hung parliament. The Conservative government was defeated in the debate on the King's speech. Ramsay MacDonald was invited to form the first minority Labour government. A further bill giving married mothers equal rights was introduced by Mrs Margaret Wintringham, a Liberal, she was only the third woman, incidentally, to be elected to the Commons and only the second to take her seat because the first had, of course, refused to take her seat because she was an Irish Republican. There we go. So it looked as if all was set fair. Here were these bills giving women equal rights introduced uh, into the House on three successive sessions. But there were powerful voices raised against equal rights. There were some people who were prepared to say they didn't believe in equality. Lord Benbow of Southam argued that women were not equal, they never will be equal, and you cannot make them equal. Others voiced more practical doubts, which found echoes for much of the 20th century. Lord Asquith himself was concerned that dividing parental authority would be bad for children. What is at stake is the well-being of the child itself and any duality of control must militate against that. Sir Charles Byron, who was the chief magistrate, told the 1922 Joint Committee that interfering with the father's natural primacy would sacrifice entirely the peace of the home and the interests of the children. <laughs> in his experience, the women who appeared in his court were not bothered about equal guardianship. If they had equal rights, there would have to be a way of resolving disputes and the intrusion of the courts into family life would bring discord. Sir Claude Schuster, the legendary permanent secretary in the Lord Chancellor's office, argued that it was essential for an administrative point of view that a household should be treated as a single unit and there should be one person within it entitled to take decisions. He also thought that such dip disputes were inherently non-justiciable. He told the 1922 Joint Committee the courts are about rights, but, quote, there are no rights here, it's a question of discretion. To take a ridiculous instance, 
a dispute whether a child is to go to one school or to another school, how on earth is a court to deal with that? End quote. Well, ridiculous or not, I well remember having had to decide whether a rugby mad boy should go where he should go to school when I was in the family division. I was actually sitting in Newcastle. Uh, he'd been put down at birth for Gordonstoun, which was his father's school, but his mother had converted to Catholicism and wanted him to go to Ampleforth. I decided that he should go to Sedba, <laughs> which is not only where that great man went to school, but also it was a very notable rugby school, and he got a rugby scholarship and did very well, thank you. <laughs> I didn't find it very difficult, so there we are. But that's what, um, that's what Sir Claude thought. And in June 1923, officials who shared Sir Claude's views got Parliamentary Council to draft a compromise bill. During the course of 1924, there were negotiations between the officials who were opposed to equal rights and Mrs. Wintringham and her supporters. And the government introduced the compromise bill in May 1924 and it went through all its stages in the Lords. The Labour government fell in October 20, 1924 but the Conservative Manifesto pledged to ensure equal rights for women in the guardianship of children. The Conservatives won the election with a large majority. The King's speech committed them to introduce legislation. But it was the 1924 compromise which they introduced, and that eventually became the Guardianship of Infants Act 1925. The preamble to the Act proudly declared, quote, Whereas Parliament, by the Sex Disqualification Removal Act 1919 and various other enactments, has sought to establish equality in law between the sexes, and it is expedient that this principle should obtain with respect to the guardianship of infants and the rights and responsibilities conferred thereby. Dot, dot, dot. But in fact, the Act did not give married mothers equal rights and authority over their children. It did provide that where in any proceeding before any court, the custody or upbringing of a child was in question, the welfare of the child was to be the court's first and paramount consideration. And the court was not to take into account whether from any other point of view, the claim of the father was superior to the claim of the mother or vice versa. And a mother who was granted custody could also be granted maintenance for the child. She could even get an order while the parents were still living together, although it wouldn't be enforceable until they separated. The mother was also given an equal right to appoint a guardian to act after her death. And the consent of both parents was required to the marriage of a minor child. But she didn't have equal rights and authority while they were together. Possibly the most important aspect of, of that act, however, was that jurisdiction to make these orders was extended to the magistrates' courts. So for the first time, working class women could claim the right to look after their own children. And there were various provisions about maintenance as well. But the court's powers were limited to custody, access and maintenance. Uh, the women's leader in a magazine called Common Cause commented, how therefore a dispute about religion where no question of custody arises can come before the court, it is difficult to see. Though we must admit that we've been told in this connection that nothing is impossible to a clever lawyer. I don't know whether clever lawyers did find a way around it, but I suspect they didn't. Married mothers still only got rights if the father died or a court gave her some. And that is why it became standard practice to make custody and access orders in divorce and separation proceedings. It's also why the practice of splitting custody from care and control grew up to accommodate the perceived need for the father to retain some authority over his children, even though they were actually being looked after by the mother, especially if she was deemed the guilty party. So he had custody and the right to make all the big decisions, while the mother was left with care and control, literally holding the baby. Some family law experts continued to believe that the mother's lack of rights and authority didn't matter while the parents were still living together. I very well remember the great Professor Bromley, author of the leading academic textbook on family law and a colleague of mine in the University of Manchester, expressing just this view in the early 1970s. 
What did it matter, he said, while they're still living together, that he's in charge and she has no rights and authority? That's what he said. But of course it mattered very much for such things as getting a passport, consenting to medical treatment, going on school trips, all the myriad decisions which have to be made about children while they're growing up. Third parties, such as schools and healthcare professionals, needed to know where they stood. So it took until the Guardianship Act 1973 for married mothers at long last to achieve equal rights and authority over their children's upbringing without a court order or their husband's death. This has now been replaced by the Children Act 1989, which gives both parents parental responsibility for a child and defines parental responsibility as all the rights, duties, powers, responsibilities and authority which by law a parent of a child has in relation to the child and his property and it also abolished the rule of law that a father is the natural guardian of his legitimate children. Parents can go to court to get specific issues as well as the living arrangements for their child resolved. And this hasn't, as far as I'm aware, led to the sort of problems which Sir Claude Schuster feared. There are no known cases of the courts having to resolve disputes between parents who are still living together, but they could if they had to. But courts and lawyers are creatures of habit. And even after the 1973 Act, it remains standard practice to include custody, care and control, and access orders in divorce and separation cases, although this was no longer necessary in order to give the mother some, some rights. And this is why the Children Act 1989 expressly states that the court is not to make an order unless doing so would be better for the child than making no order at all. There was another relic of the 1925 compromise which took time to sort out. The bill put forward by the women's groups in the 1920s had made the child's welfare the sole consideration in deciding questions about care and upbringing. But Lord Chancellor Cave successfully proposed amending this to first and paramount. He believed that such things as the conduct and wishes of the parents should be independently relevant. However, in 1969, the House of Lords declared that the child's welfare was not only the first consideration because it was of first importance, but it was the paramount consideration because it, quote, ruled on or determined the course to be followed, end quote. This, in effect, made it the sole consideration. It doesn't appear that their lordships were actually acquainted with the legislative history of the 1925 Act, which would have told them that, that was deliberately not the case. But there we go. Uh, and, but that decision was the reason why the Law Commission's draft of the bill which became the Children Act 1989 said that the child's welfare was to be the court's only concern. But in fact, the Children Act says that it is paramount. So people were still bothered that it shouldn't be the only concern. Uh, fortunately, the Supreme Court has since held that this means that all other considerations are relevant only insofar as they pertain to the welfare of the child. So there we are. We've got to equality for the children of married parents. But what about children born outside marriage? Well, it wasn't exactly the reverse of a child born to a married couple, but it developed into something close. The common law position was that a child born outside marriage was the son of nobody, and sometimes called filius nullius, sometimes filius populi. This meant that he was of kin to nobody and couldn't inherit from either side of his family. It also meant that no one had guardianship of him. There are reported cases in the 18th century that suggest that rich and powerful fathers who wished to recognize their bastard children were able to prevail against the mothers unless they had employed either force or fraud to get charge of the children. But in general, of course, the position was absent fathers and what was the position of the mother. Well, according to Lord Herschel, in the case of Bernardo and McHugh, in 1891, quote, it seems to me that there was in former times a disposition 
to carry out rigorously to its logical conclusion the doctrine that an illegitimate child was filius nullius and to hold that no one possessed in relation to it the full parental rights which the law recognizes in the case of legitimate offspring. But, he went on to say, the duty to maintain the child imposed upon the mother by the poor law of 1830 made it impossible to regard her as destitute of any rights in relation to its custody. And since the Judicature Act, it was no longer important to inquire what her rights were at common law, because all courts were governed by equitable rules. So the desire of the mother as to the custody of the child was, quote, primarily to be considered, end quote, unless it could be shown to be seriously detrimental to the child. And the upshot of this was that a mother was granted a writ of habeas corpus to retrieve her child from Dr. Bernardo, although she had signed an agreement to leave the child with the Bernardo's homes for 12 years. And the same conclusion was reached in 1931 in a case called Re Carroll, where the mother wished to retrieve her child from a Protestant society which had placed him with a Protestant couple with a view to adoption in order that he be placed with a Roman Catholic society who would arrange for him to be brought up institutionally. And it was held that the 1925 Act had only changed the position as between married parents and not between a parent and third parties. So the mother's wishes as to her child's religious education were the primary consideration. So what about the father? Well, he might make the child a ward of court in order to challenge the mother's claims and wishes, but he had no statutory right to bring proceedings for custody or access under the Guardianship of Infants Act, as the mother had, until the Legitimacy Act of 1959. Astonishing, isn't it, really? You know, because this is the act which gave you a statutory right to go to the magistrate's court or county courts, not, you know, not to have to go to the High Court in wardship proceedings. He may have been better able to resist the mother's claim for habeas corpus or in wardship proceedings. So there we are. So until 1987, the father could only obtain some parental rights and authority if the court gave him some, or the mother appointed him guardian to act after her death. The Family Law Reform Act, 1987, abolished the legal distinctions between children born to married or unmarried parents, but it didn't give unmarried fathers equal and automatic parental rights and authority. The original Law Commission proposals had thought that this was the inevitable consequence of eliminating the legal differences between the children. But this provoked objections from lone parent organizations who were worried that irresponsible fathers would harass struggling lone mothers. And so the 1987 Act provided that this would not be automatic but that a court order could actually give the father parental rights and authority. And the Children Act 1989 went further and provided that the mother could make a formal agreement to share parental responsibility with the father. But this was rarely done. And it could be a court. So you could have a mother's agreement or a court order. But since 2002, any father who's named in the birth registration automatically shares parental responsibility with the mother. So that means almost all fathers. I think it's 95% of fathers are actually registered these days. It's not every father, therefore, but it is the vast majority. So unmarried fathers have nearly caught up with married mothers, but not entirely, because not only do not all of them automatically have parental rights and authority, but they are the only people who can be deprived of it. Mothers can't be deprived of it except by an adoption order, uh, and married fathers can't be deprived of it, but unmarried fathers can. So there is still not full equality between the sexes in relation to parental rights. But I think this whole tale shows how the purpose of family law and the concept of a family have changed over time. It's no longer catering for the dynastic needs of the propertied classes. It is now catering for the welfare and needs of all the family members, but particularly those for whom we should all feel most responsible, the children and young people who are our future. Thank you.